I'm so glad y'all here tonight. We have the, um, the, I want y'all to remember, so we're coming up on the fall festival. And it's an opportunity to reach. It's an opportunity to reach uh, some, some children in our community. Uh, we were talking, I was talking with Tilo, and Leslie had just in the children's church today, she had 18 in children's church. And then we had, we still had children in the nursery too. How many was back there? There's five or six in the nursery. And so it was very interesting, you know, that, and there's piles more. Brother Robert uh, Bateman was telling me just a second ago, where did he go to? He's, he's all right, we'll make sure he's okay. But um, he was telling me that, that he saw another family in the community, and uh, there's always needs. So we, we bring them the message of Christ, and we leave it at that, okay? Uh, Y'all continue to remember our, our offering over here, our Margaret Lackey offering. And then, of course, this coming Wednesday, we'll have uh, a business meeting. The reports are on the table back there. And then it also has uh, different things uh, from YEC to children fundraisers. They are doing the pecans. That's another one of the programs for the children and the youth as fundraisers for their camps and stuff. So every year they've been raising money for that. So as we begin tonight, uh, I want you to remember, we have several of our family have been sick. There's several things coming up uh, with different people in our church family. It's going to be having some procedures done. Uh, we're just going to pray in the name of Jesus uh, for all these individuals, uh, those who've already been through some procedures. Everybody's getting better. Uh, but it's, it just seems like we've been in a season where there's a lot of people have been sick, right? There's been a lot of our families have been sick. Now, don't let all that stuff discourage you. Just remember who's in control. We've had multiple cancers and everything. God is still on the throne. He's still watching after his own. So let's open up with prayer tonight in the name of Jesus. Anybody have any specific prayers they want to mention? Yes? What's her name? Miss Jean Shukro. Mm -hmm. Jean Shukro. So y'all remember her in prayer. She's having a double mastectomy this coming week. Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, tonight we come, Lord, to the throne room, Lord, knowing the peace that lies right there, knowing, God, as we come, Father, that the answers, the solutions, the peace is all right there in your presence. And we come in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, lifting our hearts and our voices in praise, and, Father, just knocking on the door. Shouting to all who surround us that Jesus saves. <coughs> Father, in our community, there's many needs. In our, in our houses, there's many needs. In our church, there's many needs. But nothing's overwhelming to you, Father. Even when we hear about the cancers and the, the different things, we've had so many people who've had cancer surgery here lately. But, Father, you have guided and led each and every doctor and all these different ones. And I pray tonight, Father, for those who've already went through the procedures and as they continue to recover for their healing, Father. And I pray for this sister in Christ who's facing this double mastectomy in the name of Jesus, that you would guide the doctor once again, that you'd watch over this lady, and that, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you might touch her, that you'd touch the doctor, that he'd be led in everything that he does as he does this procedure, that you would touch the nurses as they minister to her needs. And, Father, we pray, God, for, for those that just can't come anymore. But, Father, we have those that have been sick. Even as Brother Marcel's been out there, Lord, um, first time he's been having some sickness in his life. And we pray for Brother Marcel in the name of Jesus that you would touch him, that you would heal him, that you would strengthen him. We pray, Father, Lord, for all those who just can't make it to church. Maybe they can't drive tonight. Maybe they can't see like they used to. Maybe, maybe they're not home. And we're just praying in the name of Jesus that you watch over those. We pray tonight, Father, as we come in this meeting, that, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you will find, Lord, everything said and everything done glorifying to you. That, Father, our faith will shine forth. 
in our examples and our testimony. For, Father, we know our testimony goes before us. As we go out there, Lord, that, Father, people know us by our witness. And I pray, Father, that in the name of Jesus, that we continue to witness to those that are around us. We pray for Emmett County right here. We pray for this Mount Pleasant and Gloucester and Franklin, all these surrounding areas, Father. For, Father, Lord, the needs are so much. There are so many lost out here today. There are so many that are lost and hurting. They're undone. But, Father, we know that you can save and deliver and change and transform. I thank you, Father, for the workers who have their hands, Lord, at, at the very meal. And, Father, they're working diligently to bring people the message of hope. Even Brother Ellis was out there today as he was preaching and delivering the message. And, Lord, they had a decision at that church today. And I thank you so much for that. I thank you so much for today with, with the, the woman who come to church with us. I thank you so much uh, for the ones that have visited. And I thank you so much for those that, Lord, that we've been planting the seeds with. And we're asking, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would draw them. I pray, Father, for our nation as it goes through the turmoil with people that are uh, killing others, innocents. They're going and murdering people for Lord, unbiblical reasons. Mm. They're being ungodly in what they do. And I pray, Father, that, Lord, people would see Christianity for what it truly is. Those who bring peace in the name of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, Father, you told us to fight the darkness. You told us to go out there and, Lord, be a testimony and a witness. And you said always do it in love. And I pray, Father, that people would find us as the body of Christ doing that, even as we were at the associational meeting the other night, and, Lord, they were talking about how uh, there was battles that were lost this year. Sometimes we don't even say those things, but there were battles that were lost in the legislature this year. But, Father, he told us we have that victory. You told us we have that victory. Father, throughout the word, we know that we have the victory in the name of Jesus Christ, that the war's already won. So we continue to, Lord, fight in the battle. Fight the good fight in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will just sweep through here. That you will raise up people to play instruments. To be biblical teachers. To be deacons. To be servants for Christ. For without you, it's just another position. It's just another thing that we do. So, Father, we're asking that the Holy Spirit... We'll draw. We'll draw people. And that, Lord, we will find ourselves looking at what really matters in our life. And that how important it is to be dedicated to the ministry of Christ. Not only just in our head. Not only just because we were baptized. But in our actions. May the word of God always enlighten us with the truth as we open the words and receive it. Bless Brother Raymond as he ministers, and Miss Sharon, and Miss Virgie, and all those who will be participating in this, this praise and worship, and Brother Eddie, and all of them, Father. For, Father, we come in this little old church to spread the gospel. May it always be something that has a priority in our eyes. May we look for the cause of Christ and to the cause of Christ as being priority of evangelizing, of ministering, and mentoring people in the faith. So, Lord, have your will and way. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right. I want everybody to join with us now in singing tonight. First one is At the Cross. At the Cross. <clears throat>
sound good tonight. This next one is, I need thee every hour. <coughs> so true. This next one is I love thee. We need him and we love him. That's all of our songs tonight. Miss Sharon is going to come and bring her what well, she's going to bring us a special. She's already here. Yeah. <laughs> is it hot in here, y'all? Yeah. Yes. Yeah and no. It's hot up here. going to practice on y'all. I didn't know I was singing until I got here. So, <laughs> um, Father Along. I love this song. It seems like the more goes on in the world, the more appropriate this song is. Tempted and tried, we half made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. 
songs I really love it I think it reflects a lot of on how we think today you may not understand everything but one of these days we will we're going to understand it better in the by and by if you open your Bibles up to James chapter 4 James chapter 4 we're going to look at verses 5 and 6 to start with I want to talk to you about something about when the humble are exalted when the humble are exalted James chapter 4 I seen something the other day when I was at that uh, associational meeting, so I was looking. I'm glad to see y'all still got y'all's Bibles, okay? Bring your Bible, bring your Bible. You need to have that word with you all the time. Now, I guess I'm, uh, I guess it shows my age or whatever, but, um, you know, I, I can have that Bible on my phone and everything that's good. But you know that phone has a lot of other stuff on it, too. That phone has a lot of stuff on it. My Bible is strictly my Bible. The Word. That Bible, how many times have I put it in people's hands as uh, we close that casket up? Their Bibles with the pages worn because they've been reading. Bible. Something rides with you in your vehicle. You don't ever complain. You don't gripe. That Bible comes with us when we go in places that normally wouldn't go. 
and he gives you comfort in the most trying of situations. The Bible is special. And not everybody's got one, believe it or not. Not everybody has that word. Don't take it lightly. I saw a man one time, he saved his money for a long time because he wanted a particular study Bible in, in the, that extra large print. So this Bible was huge. And it had a, uh, you know, it, it cost uh, quite a bit. And he met a man. You know, this is true, because I was there. And he, he had told me he was living on uh, retirement money, and he said, Brother Blaine, I'm saving up to get this particular study by. And he got it, and it was brand spanking new, and it wasn't but just a few weeks later. And we were going around as we were ministering. He kept telling me, he was showing me just all the different things in his Bible and, and how he could see it now like he couldn't see before. And he met a man, me and him, me and him together, and the man did not have a Bible. And he was, this was actually, now get this, this was an inmate. It's an inmate we had been witnessing to for a long time. And he was in for a heinous crime. But he had made a decision for Christ. Now, of course, you've heard of jailhouse, jailhouse confessions. But I've also seen the real deal. And this guy never asked for nothing. But they were fixing to ship him out. He was going to be on a transport and he was leaving to go to prison. And he told us, he says, you know, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in jail. He says, but as long as I have breath from now on, I'm going to share Jesus with somebody no matter where I'm at. And as he was leaving, I seen my buddy takes that Bible, that Bible he had saved for, put money away for. And he goes up to him, he says, son, I want you to take this Bible, and I want you to use it for the glory of God. And I saw him give this precious gift that he had saved for so long and put it in a man's hands. I saw that guy get on that bus and leave. And he would send us letters of what he was doing with that Bible and how he was taking and showing people the truth in it. This Bible's precious. Don't take it lightly. Amen. James chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. If you can stand with me as we read God's holy word. Now watch this. I want you to, I want you to think about this. This is spoken to us. It says, Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. But he gives a greater grace, therefore, it says. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let's use that as our scripture. Father, we thank you for the truth in the word. We thank you so much, God, that, Lord, we have the freedom in America to still possess and own a Bible. And, Father, that, Lord, the truths that were written all those years ago are still relevant today for your people that you called us to be. You called us out of darkness. And you didn't just put us on a path, but you give us a plan. And you showed us the path to walk, Father. So, Lord, we pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that we always keep our relationship humble. That our lives will be an example to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So as you look at the book right here, as you look at the book of James, what we need to remember something right here is that James was writing to the Christian Jews of the dispersion. And as you're seeing it, these Christians were living among, can you believe it, non-Christians all over the world. Sounds kind of like it is today, doesn't it? It sounds like an example to us. See, we're still living out here in this world, and can you imagine living in Mississippi amongst the Bible Belt that there are non-Christians that surround us all the time? People that are strangers to the grace of God. That don't understand nor have a relationship with the living God. So when they see you get up to go to church or when they see you going out there with your family, you're the only Christ that they're seeing right now. That reflection of Jesus is showing up in your life. And how you handle stuff, how you deal with things in your life. The world has succeeded, really, if you look at it and understand, it's penetrating so many hearts today. 
It's penetrating so many lives of believers because they're seeing what the world is saying, what the world is doing, and instead of holding to the truth of the Word of God, what they're doing is picking up and saying, well, you know what? That's okay because God will forgive me. We're starting to say, you know, we're taking our relationship with Christ, we're taking the Word of God, and, and we're just, just throwing it away. We're throwing it away. So these words today are just as relevant when you understand the Scripture uh, to us as it was to these Jewish Christians. It's still speaking to us today on how we should handle our lives. So when you look in those first ten verses right there of chapter 4, James writes about the worldliness or the south self-gratification in the Christian life. Sound familiar? Everybody's looking to see if it's, if it's okay, if it feels good, I'm going to do it. I don't care what the Word of God says. If it's all right uh, with, with my neighbors, I'm not affecting them. It, it's it's going to be okay. See, that's what it's speaking to. In James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, look at what it says right here. It says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? Watch now. You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You're envious and you cannot attain. So you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. See, James says that the obsession that people have with, with that self-gratification is because is, is, is the cause of the wars and, and the fighting among God's people. You see it in churches all around. You see it in, in the body of Christ. You see people that are fighting. Christians say that the chief end of man is to glorify God, right? We've all been out there saying, I, I want my life to glorify God. I want every aspect of it to be a testimony for the glory of God. And, and that we're going to enjoy God forever one day. We'll be in his presence. But another philosophy that's taken uh, over and control it, it originates in that sinful human heart. It, it comes against people and says that pleasure, that my happiness, what I want to do, it constitutes my chief goals of life is going out there and doing what makes me happy. One of the common songs that they have today, if it makes you happy, everybody goes and says, if it makes you happy, it's okay. Is it? Is it? So you've got to understand your flesh. See, in other words, the chief goal of life, some people think, is not glorifying God of all creation who saved you, who died upon the cross of Calvary to set you free, but glorifying myself. And when I start glorifying myself, I am reflecting something that is against God's will to this world. And I wear the badge of Christianity and say, you want to see a Christian? Paul says, you want to see a Christian look at me? Look at my life? Look at how I live. If Paul can say that to us today, what are we saying? See, James, he asks he asked some questions right here. So what causes these wars? What, what causes fighting among you? What causes all this kind of stuff? He's not referring to the international wars. He's not talking about all these wars between nations right here. He's talking about these feuds and these conflicts that develop among God's people. He's talking about things that should be a rarity that you shouldn't even understand. When you look at this, wars, fights, they're really significant words. It always something that really grabs your heart right here. You go back and you look in the Greek at this, that Greek word for war, it means something that's a continual thing. It, it means it's always, it's a chronic state of feuding or hostility. How many people like that hostility? How many people like conflict? No, nah, we don't like it. Then why do we participate in it? You see, the Greeks... Uh, the Greek for fighting, when you look at that word, what it does is suggest this flare-up or these outbreaks that result from these underlying tensions. And what's the tension? See, James, he answers, he goes on, and, and, and this is part of the Bible. You'll see this over and over. James answers his, his first question with his second. It, it's not your, your passions that are at war. It, 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 it's, it's not your passions that, that are doing this war in your members. James saying that quarrels and conflicts arise amongst God's people because they're having their own way is their chief aim. Hmm. 
Now, this never happens, thank you, Jesus, in Mount Pleasant. This is something that Brother Ellis can take to one of those other churches over there. That he, he is an evangelist. He can go speak to them all the time. But what happens here is we don't even look at it this way. We don't look at what's motivating us to do or say what we do or say. We're not looking at what's stirring our hearts and, and what's causing this. See, James says that war is, wars are in your members. Not, he's not talking about the members of the congregation. He's talking about the members of our body within us. In other words, these external wars start within us because we always see everything else and not our own hearts. It's so easy for us to see the problem with somebody else it's so easy to look past and justify your behavior. And here's a question. Have you ever justified what you did? Have you ever justified what you did? Or did you turn to the Word of God and let the Word of God take control? Did you allow the Word of God to come in and start speaking to your heart where you look at it differently? Well, what we normally do is our members inside of ourselves is we start saying, well, this is why I did this. This is why I'm doing this. This is what's making me do this particular behavior. Really? Is that what God said we should do? Is this what the Scripture says we should do? In James chapter 4, verse 3, it says, You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your own pleasures right here. <coughs> James, he's getting more specific. So he's going over there from verse 2, and he's developing that rela relationship between the passions and the war that's taking place in, the, in, in these families right here. And he simply say, what can and does happen when people choose that self-gratification, those self-things over God's way, our life is destructive. He's saying it's something that, that starts these kind of wars. This passion to satisfy ourselves. what it does is it starts undermining the effectiveness of your prayer life. It starts undermining what you're doing for Christ in the first place. If we got our sights set on the things below, the things below, and that's what destroys people. That's what destroys the body of Christ is everybody gets so passionate on the things below below stuff materials colors things below when it should be centered upon the passion of christ it should be centered on our calling it should be centered on our glorifying the master see if we got our sights looking at the stuff below it's only natural we seek those things we look at those things, and then we justify it and say, well, this is what I think, right? This is why I did what I did. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 2, look at what he says. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now think about this right here. I want you to think about this. Even, even after we're Christians, it's possible for us to place our, our, our wrong value on stuff. Even within the church itself, in relation to the purpose of Christ in our lives. So what is your purpose? What is your purpose? So everybody has a title head. My title head is, is preacher, pastor. Okay? What's your title head? What is your calling for the glory of God? What is your position... In the body of Christ, each of us, as the body of Christ, has members that are, work better together than we do separate. But sometimes we don't understand what our calling is. And as we open the Word of God and we look at our calling and let the Holy Spirit just wash over us, we start understanding truly what we should be doing. Even after we're Christians, it, we get out here sometimes and, and we pursue things that really do not glorify God. Have you seen it? So what does James mean when, 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 his, when he says, you ask wrongly? Now think about it. He, he might be referring to 
how we ask for the wrong things possibly, those wrong treasures, it, it can be done as a result of just plain ignorance. They just don't realize that what they're doing, but more likely what he's actually saying when you study it is it's an evil intent in our heart. Wow. That there's wrong motives behind what we're asking for and why we're asking for it. You see, when we, Paul says, you know, that we, we should always be looking, examining ourselves, examining ourselves. But do we do it? What is motivating my speech? What is motivating my behavior? What is motivating how I go and do things? Even how I tithe or anything else. What's motivating that behavior? And what he does, he, he comes up here and he clarifies it with something else. He says, to spend it on your own passions. So what are our passions? What, are we, what is really motivating our heart in the body of Christ right here? What motivates you? Is it Bibles? Is it carpet? Is it sound systems? What motivates you? Our tendency is to go and gratify ourselves is awful to God. And when you look at it sometimes and you really examine yourself of, of why we're doing and what we're saying and why we're saying it, and, and James speaks of this unfaithful creatures in verse 4. He talks about it. He, he's talking of... Of, of the people that are of unfaithful to God. The friends uh, of the world, are, are, it says, is, are the enemies of God. So when I, when I think of everything except the cause of Christ, when, when the passion in your heart isn't for soul winning, isn't for going out there and mentoring the body of Christ, isn't for reaching and pulling them in, there's lots of people who have lots of passions. You know, in our particular area, as we come up on this season, people develop a, a passion for hunting. And they pursue it, and it, there's nothing wrong in itself except when it starts overcovering what your calling is for Christ. When your passion to hunt silences your mouth with the testimony about where your relationship of Christ is, there's a problem. When your passion to go out there and do something, no matter what it is, but you silence yourself because you do not want to make anybody uncomfortable, what are you doing with your relationship of Christ? You're hiding the light. You're putting it up under a bushel basket. You're doing everything in Scripture it says we shouldn't do. It's so hard to believe that we have a tendency to do those things and place value on things that really aren't going to matter. And we're going to place value on things that are going to rot, that are going to decay. And one of these days, all these good old boys that we run with or hang with are good old girls, and we never share with them Christ, whose blood is those hands on? Who's, who's going to have the blood on their hands because they didn't share the truth of their faith? How many people look and, and they say, we're always talking about, well, you know, when it comes to committees and stuff. Well, it's because where's the passion? Where's the passion to serve the risen Savior? Where's the passion to plant your feet right here and say, this is where God's called me? It's so easy to start submitting to your heart. It's so easy to start saying, you know what? I'm going to do what the world says. I don't care about it. You know what? <laughs> Drinking don't send you to hell. Uh, you know, going over here and going to the bars, that don't send you to hell. Uh, you know, when we start justifying what we're doing, where's Christ in your passion? It's so easy to say, I'm going to do what I want, how I want. But God says it's something that's awful. And James, he, he talks about these unfaithful creatures. He's, he's talking of the, the people that are just not faithful to Jesus. Not faithful to God himself. So what he says, he's, he quotes something out of Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. He quotes something. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. He says, though he scoffs at the scoffers, yet he gives grace to afflicted. You see, God opposes the proud. And one of the biggest things is, and you know, in the South, we always try to be, this, this, it's a strange kind of humble sometimes when you look at it. We, we, we say we're humble, but look at how we do things. Sometimes we're like that old peacock. You ever go to plantations, you see them old peacocks? 
he's walking along, kind of minding his own business. Next thing you know, he's got them tail feathers going up, and he's doing it like a turkey, right? He's waving them tail feathers and everything, so everybody sees at that particular moment, at that particular time. See, what the proud do is they defy God. Why are we here? See, that's where the examination comes. Sometimes we just want, we won't admit that, of the sovereignty of God in, in my life. Or, or that he's sovereign over the world. Or, or, or that he's sovereign over all the lives. And we say, I'm going to do what I want, when I want, how I want. And we take it and we go out there and we live our lives according to what we think is best. And it's so destructive. It's so destructive. It destroys everything around you. Why? Because we get prideful. It says in chapter 4 of James, verses 7 and 9, look what it says. It says, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and watch this, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And watch. I mean, this, uh, cleanse your hands, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable, watch this, he's telling them how to act to this, and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. And you look at these scriptures right here, the tendency of the unregenerate and humankind, what it does is, is when you're lost, it demands repentance. See, no one wants to repent anymore. No one wants to say that they've had sin in their lives. No one wants to say that they're hanging on to stuff that they should be letting go of. No one wants to say that they're living their lives in a way it shouldn't be lived. This paragraph, what it does, it, it also comes up with just a brief exhortation. And it's uttered real quick. The way it's described when you're looking at it, it's like a command in the military right here. And each one of these commands calls for this, the self-seeking Christian, the worldly Christians, those who are out there just doing their own thing. He says, repent, repent and turn to God. All of it is about getting your lives lined up with the word of God so that our behavior, our thoughts, everything is a reflection of Jesus Christ and not nothing else. The reason the world is going going to hell in a handbag is because the Christians are carrying the handbag. <laughs> Amen, baby. <laughs> and we're saying this is the way it should be. And you see, everything calls itself a church now. Everything's a church. And we even rationalize what everything's a church. Scripture. Scripture is, is the truth for us. James, what he does, when, when you look at him, he sounds like this Old Testament prophet, right? He's up there, and he's, he's putting it down flat. And he's saying, you know what? What we call it is you need to rededicate your life to Christ. You need to get your life and look at it and say, is this truly a reflection of Christ? Or have I been just half-stepping? Have I just been... Just walking on the edge. Just seeing how far I can get over the edge. See, we all have excuses of why we do what we do. But I'm going to tell you something. We all say, well, the day is growing short. Let me tell you, the day is growing short. And I pray that we're all found serving the master. So the whole essence of repentance is revealed in James is that appeal to, to, to be wretched. He said, listen, look at your lives, and it should break it. When is the last time you were broken about your walk with Christ, about your relationship with Christ? Now, when I say that, everything in your life, from your marriage, your father, everything is a reflection of your relationship. How is your relationship? Why are we not broken? He says, mourn and weep. And I'm going to tell you, you have all the calls, and no one comes down here. No one comes down here. No one comes down here. And it's never going to affect the pastor. I'm telling you. But whatever has taught us where we do not mourn about our spiritual walk with Christ is a problem. 
when we do not weep about how we do things. Sometimes all we do is say, well, I'm sorry. And we just walk on. You know what he's saying, dude? He says, look at it. He says, look at it. I remember my, my sister-in-law had a horrible wreck after her. Her husband had died with a stroke unexpectedly in his 30s. He hadn't been dead very long, just a few months. And he's buried up there in a, the military cemetery in Springfield, Missouri. And when I did his funeral, it was snow. And I remember when I led him to Christ. I led him to Christ in Walker, Louisiana many years ago. In the parking lot of a church. He wasn't even at a church service. I pulled over and I started talking to him about this right here. About what his life truly was. And what it truly means to be surrendered to Christ. Well, so many months after that funeral, she was in an accident. Not quite sure what happened. Not quite sure what was taking place. Maybe, maybe her thoughts were on her husband. Maybe her thoughts were on all sorts of things in her life. And she went off, she hit a culvert, and the culvert came through the bottom of the car, and it literally almost cut her foot completely off. And when they called us to the hospital, they said it was, it was amputated. But when it, it was still attached by just a little bit of meat. And as I was looking in there, and I was looking at that foot of how it was separated, how it was just hanging there, I started thinking right here how awful it was, how ugly it was, how horrible, because her leg was straight, and her, le her foot was sitting there like, just like this, sitting up. Just hanging by the meat. I said, that's terrible. It's terrible. I felt so sorry for her. I felt so terrible about that situation. Do you think how ugly, how ugly it is to God of how we do things? How we speak things? How we handle things? Can you imagine he says it ought to be something that's righteous to us, that repulses us, something that makes me weep. But when you get to look in these scriptures, you say, when's the last time you wept? When's the last time you wept? So when you start realizing what your sinfulness has done to a righteous and living God, that makes you uncomfortable, do Even as I'm speaking, I'm squirming. I'm nobody. I'm the, I'm the least of the least. But when I picture, I think about that right there, how horrible the sight it was things I've seen where people were in horrible, horrible conditions. And I think about how my skin must appear to God. How my tongue and my life and my actions, how destructive they can be. <coughs> when you look at this, when you look at verse 10, James 4, verse 10. Jesus will up this light. Coming up. Thank you, Brother Charlie. And watch this. That key word, underline this. Underline this right here. You got a pen, underline it. Humble yourselves <coughs> in the presence of the Lord. And he will exalt you. See, that's the result when we weep over that kind of spiritual condition when we realize how ugly sin is, when we realize that the only hope we have is a relationship that's truly on fire for Jesus, that, that is when your life is transformed. Because when you humble yourselves, God is going to exalt you. And can anybody exalt you more?
and God himself. If you could bow your heads for just a moment. Right now in just a few minutes. So if you're in the choir, if you're not in the choir and you want to sing in our cantata, we'll, we'll be glad to have you. Y'all come sing, y'all come on.